Hi, I'm Heather Hurlbert. I direct the New Models of Policy Change Initiative here at New America. And I'm so delighted to welcome you to the first event in our um, new policy series. We are so excited to be kicking off this partnership with Bridging the Gap um, and to match their dedication to um, getting, helping scholars engage with policy relevant work and our interest in helping get policy relevant work to the broadest possible audiences and spark new conversations and new ways, not just about what US foreign policy is, but who it is that's doing it and how they're doing it. Uh, given that, we're particularly delighted that um, the first in this, what is going to be an ongoing series, um, features Dr. Anjali Dayal, a scholar whose work looks at why combatants go to the UN for peacekeeping even when they don't think the UN will be successful, and Ashish Pradhan from International Crisis Group. Um, we, of course, planned this event um, before the war in Ukraine began, but over the last week, you may have seen both um, Anjali and Ashish taking part in really fascinating conversations about the role of the UN Security Council, the role of UN institutions, the role of UN norms in the war Ukraine this week. So um, this couldn't be a more timely conversation and all kudos to the organizers. You're now gonna hear from one of the organizers, uh, Jim Goldgeier, who is senior advisor to Bridging the Gap, professor of international relations at American University, former Dean of the School of, American, of International Service at American University, visiting scholar at Stanford and longtime collaborator, friend and um, Fount of wisdom on international affairs. So, Jim, over to you. Thanks so much, Heather. And we're we're absolutely thrilled to have this partnership between New America and Bridging the Gap. Uh, Bridging the Gap's been dedicated for many years to try to help academics produce uh, policy relevant research and share it with the policy community, and also to help the policy community to become more aware of the kind of work that's being done in academia. And we run training programs for postdocs, PhDs, uh, and faculty members. Uh, we also have a New Voices in National Security project that tries to help policymakers connect with early career scholars from outside the DC area that they may not be aware of. Uh, and we have a Bridging the Gap book series with Oxford University Press. Uh, and the latest book in the series is out today, Tom Long's uh, A Small State's Guide to Influence in World Politics. Uh, great that um, we're able to work with Heather and, and Alex Stark at, at New America, and I turn it back uh, to Heather to get things moving. Thanks, Jim. Well, I'm really gonna just hand it over to um, Alex Stark at this point to, to run our conversation. And um, my colleague, Alex Stark, is really actually kind of a model of what Bridging the Gap is all about. Um, she's a senior researcher with us at New Models. Um, she's also holder of a PhD in political science from Georgetown and has really um, brought this, um, this sort of academically informed policy, policy sensibility to our work on gender and international security, on political violence, and of course, to her own work on uh, Yemen and Gulf security. So um, Alex, I am delighted to turn it over to you to run this conversation. Uh, so we're, I think, really lucky to be joined today by two uh, kind of superstar researchers. Um, like Heather said, when we were planning this event, we didn't really necessarily have the foresight to know that Russia would be invading Ukraine in the weeks leading up to it, that the UN Security Council and, and General Assembly would play such a central role in, in conversations around this crisis, or at least I, I didn't have the foresight, maybe some others did. But i um, really pleased to be able to ask them questions about that and also to talk more about what uh, Dr. Dial's research findings can tell us about, about this crisis and about the world more broadly. So uh, first, let me just introduce you to our two panelists quickly. Dr. Anjali Dial is an assistant professor of international politics at Fordham University's Lincoln Center campus. Her book, Incredible Commitments, How UN Peacekeeping Failures Shape Peace Processes, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2021, and you should buy a copy. Um, Ashish Pradhan is International Crisis Group's Senior UN Analyst. He is responsible for Crisis Group's engagement with the UN Secretariat and Security Council members, and his work primarily focuses on African and Asian crises. 
Ashish regularly relays crisis groups field-based analysis to UN officials and member state diplomats and ensures that debates at the UN are adequately reflected in crisis groups policy prescriptions. Uh, she's previously worked for three years in crisis groups Asia program conducting research on the constitution writing process in Nepal. Um, so without further ado, let's let's jump straight in. Um, Anjali, can you start by by telling us a bit about what what this book about, is about, where the ideas came from, and maybe some of the takeaways that that policymakers or others might find interesting or surprising. Yeah, absolutely. Um, first, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, the, the big question that I was trying to answer in the book is why do people turn to the UN for assistance, ending their conflicts, and sort of upholding their peace agreements, even when they don't think the UN can bring them peace or security? And the answer that I lay out in the book is that it, it's because the UN can offer them unique tactical, material, and political benefits that may actually have very little to do with peace. Some combatants are going to turn to the UN because they want peace. But all we have to do is look inside um, any peace process or any negotiation to end a war to see that a lot of the actors involved, peace may not be their primary goal. And they may be turning to the international community because they want tactical benefits, right? They may want the time to regroup or rearm. Um, they may use the opportunity to elevate certain factional leaders within the negotiating coalition, for instance. They want, may want material benefits, so they may be looking for things like the international community's assistance in post-conflict reconstruction or refugee resettlement. Um, they may be looking for a straight economic influx into, uh, into sort of either elite or more general populations. Um, or they may be looking for political benefits because negotiating with the UN on the ground, seeking out UN peacekeepers, that's a good way to certify that you're a legitimate political actor that your intentions are conciliatory, that you want to be taken seriously as a party with real ideas about governance or about the way your state should be run, that you're not just a group of people who kill others um, or who take up arms against the state. And part of the reason I wanted to look at this question is because there's this important body of work uh, both sort of policy and scholarly, that tells us that peacekeeping actually works really well. But we don't actually have that popular conception of peacekeeping. If you stopped the average person, the average well-informed person, and asked them if peacekeeping worked, they'd probably tell you no, that it's not a very effective tool or that it doesn't work where it's needed most. And that's an understandable impression to get from news coverage of peacekeeping or from a generalized sense of UN peacekeeping failures, which have been big and notable. But both these sort of conceptions, we, we need to put them alongside this idea that uh, both policy and scholarly understandings of peacekeeping usually focus on how peacekeepers can help solve security problems. And if you're a combatant or a party to civil war, you may not actually think that the UN can help you with that. They, you may have the same conception as the average person. So then the question for me really became, what do these parties actually want from the UN if they, like the average person, may not think that they're going to get peace from the UN or security from the UN? Why do they want this kind of international involvement as they try and end their conflicts? Now, part of the reason I think this is a, a relevant question for policy audiences is because in practical terms, the UN is the central point for global conflict resolution efforts. And so it seemed like a critical question to ask. Um, beyond people who care specifically about multilateral conflict resolution, also even for people who are concerned more broadly with just say international security, I think there's this tendency to think of UN peacekeepers as being sort of a small oddity on the world stage. But Actually, you know, only the US has more armed soldiers worldwide, and there are more UN peacekeepers in conflict zones worldwide than there are any other force. So this is really a central part of contemporary international security and a central I, motivating sort of force beyond contemporary conflict resolution. Now in the book, and I'm happy to talk about this more in, in Q&A, but I, I developed this argument by examining the, the Rwandan peace process from 1990 to 1994. Um, immediately preceding the genocide and the Guatemalan peace process from 1989 to 1996. Um, broadly speaking, I look at those two cases because I wanted to know what would happen um, in the Rwandan case where 
the parties to that conflict had very little reason to suspect that you wouldn't be able to bring them peace. Um, and in the Guatemalan case with the El Salvadorian example next door, they had a much stronger conception that the UN might be able to bring them peace. And in both cases, I actually find that these other benefits are much more primary drivers of their seeking out the UN. They are much more interested in the tactical, material, and political benefits that the UN can bring than they are in actual peace and security. In the Rwandan case, uh, refugee resettlement is primary, and so too is the RPF's desire to appear to be legitimate political actors. In the Guatemalan case, they looked at El Salvador, and even though that was a big international success, um, they interpreted that case as being one in which their counterparts gave up too much to the UN. So they actively worked to try and curtail some of the strongest parts of the mission in El Salvador to develop a much weaker mission than, um, than they otherwise might have gotten. And for me, one of the big policy takeaways I have from this argument is that I think these cases really push us towards a model of multilateral peacekeeping, where UN peacekeepers are really lightly armed diplomats, and we invest in those diplomatic tasks and capabilities, not a model where peacekeepers are primarily understood as like weak military actors and where they're actively involved in counterinsurgency and state stabilization missions or primarily involved in those kinds of missions. Because that model, I think, is one that could actually threaten the UN's ability to do the things that combatants seem to want most, not necessarily security, but conferring legitimacy or enabling sort of uh, refugee repatriation or working on post-conflict reconstruction. And so I think that's sort of the big policy takeaway from the, from the book. That's great. Um, Ashish, I'd love to hear your kind of top line reactions to um, Anjali's research and findings, and, and as someone who's also engaged on these issues, obviously on a day-to-day -day basis, um, are these the kinds of things that you, you see or recognize from your own work where do you see groups coming to the UN, not just for security, but also for those benefits that, that Anjali outlined, tactical, material, political kinds of benefits? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Alex and, and Anjali and everyone else for, for this conversation. I, I agree very, very timely with everything else going on. And to answer your question, Alex, and to respond to Anjali, I think absolutely, you know, we're seeing, you know, obviously, uh, in spite of everything happening in Ukraine at the moment, uh, quite a fascinating, uh, you know, dynamic uh, in the, let's say, one of the other big crisis hotspots that was dominating the headlines just a few uh, months ago, which is Afghanistan, you know, where the Taliban, obviously having taken over last fall, are now trying to, you know, consolidate their, their, their presence, you know, and get as much legitimacy as they can, you know, from the international system. And, you know, a big part of that is their uh, interaction uh, with the UN. Uh, you know, we're in the midst of the Security Council negotiating a new mandate for the UN's mission in Afghanistan, which uh, used to look very different before the takeover and will look very different, uh, you know, I think after this month. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's going to be a, a potentially a, a sort of process that will end with um, uh, hopefully a likelihood of uh, the mission continuing to do, uh, you know, a bunch of the same work it was doing uh, along monitoring human rights, uh, you know, really keeping a track on the situa situation of women and girls. And, and these issues, you know, you would think are quite, uh, you know, in some senses, maybe even non-starters for the Taliban, that they, they would never accept to having this sort of oversight from an international institution. But the, the reality seems to be actually uh, more complicated and, and more mixed and you know, certainly from crisis groups, uh, in, engagements and discussions in, in, with actors in Afghanistan, including with the Taliban, uh, you know, what we are hearing is that uh, there is actually an openness, certainly not, you know, they're not happy about it, but at least, you know, they, they're willing to stomach uh, the, the fact that the uh, UN, uh, you know, uh, will stay on will carry out uh, you know, some level of monitoring of human rights and the rights of women and girls, uh, because it means that it could fit with their overarching aim of getting international legitimacy. And I think this is a controversial issue and uh, you know, folks over at the UN, especially at the UN Secretariat, are very careful uh, to note that you know, whatever they do going forward will not be you know, conferring, you know, even by default, any amount of legitimacy that you know, they'll be working to compartmentalize as much as possible what they do on the ground. But this really speaks to, you know, I think in a concrete way, 
you know, the sort of incentives, uh, sometimes they can seem quite perverse, but the incentives that, you know, conflict actors can have to, uh, you know, see value in, in how they engage with the UN. Again, you know, a lot of this is, uh, you know, gets uh, lost in the muck. And, you know, even when conversations and, and negotiations are happening at the council, uh, you know, what I mentioned can, can get lost, uh, you know, especially when you have, uh, you know, strong positions being taken by the likes of China and Russia, who come in and say that we absolutely don't think that, uh, the UN can continue to monitor human rights in, in the country because it's a completely new reality. Uh, but it, it, in a lot of ways, this this conversation, the fact that it's more controversial in New York than it is in Kabul, I think, you know, speaks to these sort of uh, varied realities. And just, you know, one other point that I really wanted to hit on before we, we open up for, for Q&A is, is Anjali's point about the fact that the, you know, the, the UN still remains for better or worse, you know, uh, a, a focal point for global conflict resolution. And you know, there's been a lot of talk, uh, you know, in the, in the past a week, week and a half or so, rightfully so, about the, the place of the UN uh, you know, in the international, international system, but also specifically the place of Russia within the UN and within the Security Council, and whether that's something that could be changed. Uh, you know, lots of uh, column lengths have gone into whether Russia can be kicked out of the, the UN or the Council, for example. Um, setting aside the fact that, you know, I think uh, uh, practically that that's a really challenging prospect. It's more uh, feasible to maybe look at their membership of the Human Rights Council in Geneva, for instance. But setting that aside, you know, I think it could be uh, a little bit, maybe not premature, but certainly might be, uh, you know, uh, you might be missing an opportunity in the future, uh, you know, uh, of, of using the, the beauty of the UN, which is that you have all of the, the member states, you know, theoretically uh, in the same, uh, around the same table. Um, you know, it, we've seen, you know, even if it's uh, very minute at times, you know, benefits of the fact that, you know, states like pariah states, even like North Korea and Iran and others have been, uh, can continue to be members of the UN, despite all of their, uh, let's say, policy controversies, uh, to, to be very uh, uh, diplomatic. But, you know, that's, that's led to some, some benefits and the sort of contact informally that happens between diplomats from Western countries and those uh, governments in New York in itself, I think, has value. So I think, you know, it's worth thinking about that as well as the fact that the, the actual benefits of trying to kick out actors from the UN versus the benefit of keeping them in for any potential future openings is, is worth considering as well. But maybe I'll leave it there to start and very happy to go into other, other specifics in the Q&A. Yeah, on, on the question of Ukraine and Russia, um, uh, Anjali, your book is about UN peacekeeping, but it's also really about why combatants in wars decide to engage with the UN, as you laid out. Um, I know many of us were struck by the Kenyan UN ambassador, Martin Kamani's speech to the UN Security Council, uh, was it a few weeks ago now? It, it could be a few days, a few weeks, who knows? Um, where he kind of opposed Russia's claims to Ukraine and, and he said multilateralism lies on its deathbed tonight. Um, can you talk about why Security Council meetings like this one matter, even if they don't necessarily yield the kinds of tangible or material results that, that some might hope for? Yeah, absolutely. First, believe it or not, that was last week. Um, but it feels like it was like years ago at this point. Um, yeah, there's, there's, I think, an understandable urge to look at the structure of the Security Council, to look at the way it works in the world, and to think this is a useless institution at moments of absolute crisis. Um, the Security Council is built by design to overweigh the political projects of the permanent five members of the Security Council. Right. The US, the UK, Russia, China, and France are given by the charter an outsized role in maintaining international peace and security and the ability to shape it to their own will. And that obviously is a huge problem when one of the permanent members of the Security Council decides to engage in aggressive action or to violate the terms of the charter, because then there's actually no way to hold them to account for that. The, the, the system is not designed to do that. It's explicitly designed not to do that. And it's understandable when people look at it as a result and think this is corrupt, this is ineffective, this cannot protect people. And at the end of the day, nothing that happens to the Security Council in this way is going to stop Russia from invading Ukraine, is going to alleviate the suffering of Ukrainian people, right? Um, the reason it remains an important chamber, I think, has to do with the fact that it is not just a space for those permanent five members in these moments of crisis. 
It's also a space for other states to reassert the value of multilateralism and to reassert the value of um, saying this is an illegitimate action. You may have done it, you may have been able to do it. We can't, make, we can't stop you from doing it. But we can say that this is not the order we chose to live by, that this is not the charter we signed on to, that we signed onto a charter in which sovereign non-intervention and the peaceful settlement of disputes are the first and second articles that you agree to. And as a result, you know, being able to establish that diplomatic um, baseline for everyone, being able to, to establish that that's the system of rules that Russia itself signed on to uh, is critical for smaller states. And when I say smaller, you know, like, many of these states are quite large, right? I, I mean, in comparison to, to the permanent five members, they don't exercise this outsized role in international peace and security. But for them, this question of whether or not the terms of this charter can be upheld is a question of life or death, right? It's an existential question. Do we live in a world where it is possible for a powerful permanent member to invade another country, to try and take that territory, to have that not be a problem? Or do we live in a world of sovereign non-intervention being the cornerstone principle of international law, where nothing may be able to stop Russia from doing that. But diplomatically, states can come together and say, this is not what we agreed on. And I think as a result, you know, that's one important thing the Security Council does in the world in moments like this. The other thing I will say, and I, and I think, you know, Ashish can speak to this better than I can, but like in this moment, for instance, much like they did in Syria, um, Security Council has separated the humanitarian and political portfolios for Ukraine, which means that it may be possible to get some motion and some activity around um, humanitarian relief for people. And here's where the sort of other bodies of the UN become very important, um, being sort of mandated and authorized and requested to do things um, like assist people who are fleeing, right? Like sort of um, mobilize an apparatus of aid um, are also critical things that can happen in a sense. Uh, Shisha, I'd love to bring you in on this, this question too. So did you have kind of takeaways from the past week or so of, of conversations in the Security Council and the General Assembly about um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Um, what are you kind of hearing from UN officials or member states and and how they're kind of seeing the role of UN institutions in this crisis. Yeah, you know, I think Anjali spoken about spoken about you know this in, in really eloquent ways. Uh, you know, I think that that sort of introspection about the 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 uh, fit for purposeness uh, of the Council uh, in specific, but the UN as a whole, uh, you know, has been something that you know I think many of us have been thinking about. Uh, and I, I think you know to be to be honest, you know, especially to Anjali's point about the fact that. You know, it's not just about the the five permanent members. You know, the other members and and their uh, efforts. And Anjali, you detailed this in your your piece uh, again, which might be either last week or last month at, at this rate. It's it's hard to tell. Um, but you know, in in a sense, uh, you know that pattern is certainly not new, right? You know, again, you know those of us who've been following this stuff for for a while recognize that P five gridlock. Uh, has been uh, uh, um, hindering the, the the council for years, and it's actually had I think what's been one of the more um, positive trends on the council in recent years is the sort of uh, oversized role that the uh, ten elected members have been playing. And you know, Anjali, you mentioned uh, the the separation of the humanitarian and political tracks on Ukraine and in Syria, and certainly the the elected members uh, in twenty fifteen, if I remember correctly, you know, were were critical to separating that track, compartmentalizing the political issues on Syria where there was veto after veto from a humanitarian track, uh, you know, which at least enjoyed a, a level of consensus until recent years. And, uh, you know, if the, the council can establish that, that kind of compartmentalization on Ukraine, I think on balance, it would be good because, you know, we've clearly seen that on the political side, uh, it's not going to see eye to eye, and there will be no consensus because of Russia's veto. So the the efforts to uh, you know try to engage on that might uh, be a dead end, but it doesn't mean that the council has no role to play on at least mitigating and dealing with the symptoms of uh, of the conflict and of the invasion uh, in, in Ukraine. And I think that's the other uh, takeaway for me from both the uh, General Assembly and today's Human Rights Council 
uh, uh, discussions and, and resolutions is that you know, even if the other bodies, bodies of the UN might not be able to uh, adequately help address the causes of the fighting, they can at least help mitigate some of the, the, the impact and the, the suffering of the populations. You know? So we saw quite a lot of good humanitarian language in the General Assembly resolution. You know, that's really, again, meant to help uh, really mitigate and, and help people that are, for example, trying to uh, leave Ukraine in a, in a safe, orderly way, calling for not just Ukrainian citizens, but also migrants, diaspora, and others to be uh, given safe passage if they're trying to leave Ukraine. And obviously, that's been an issue that's been covered a lot in the media. And at the same time, at the uh, at the Human Rights Council today, you know, we saw again with resounding numbers, um, uh, uh, the commission uh, or the uh, sort of uh, approval or authorization of a commission of inquiry, which will be tasked with collecting evidence, which can be used for, you know, a prosecution down, down the line, you know, for accountability purposes. And, you know, it, it might feel in the moment like, you know, it's a, it is a little bit, you know, clutching the straws or, or, or what have you, but, you know, in, in terms of the sort of uh, uh, atrocities that are being reported so widely now, and maybe with increasing brutality, as we might see in the coming days and weeks, you know, the accountability piece will be in, in, of increasing importance. So the fact that the UN can play a role there, I think at least undermines, sorry, underlines the fact that, you know, again, at least in terms of the symptoms, it, it can be, it can be uh, an important player. And, uh, you know, I think just to the final thing I'll say, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, whether the, the, the council you know, as a whole um, uh, in, and, and the place of the of the UN Charter uh, that that Anjali talked about, you know, just a sort of a admission uh, of guilt in, you know, from from my own uh, perspective. You know, I've been working uh, in and around the UN for about six years, and I have to admit, um, you know, usually uh, in watching speeches and statements, I would usually sort of fast forward through the parts where. Uh, you know, ambassadors or foreign ministers would be, uh, you know, reaffirming their commitment to the UN Charter and to sovereignty and territorial integrity, because, you know, you took that as a given. But I think, again, one of the, again, this is a silver lining, maybe I'm clutching it at my own straws, but the, the fact that in the, in the past week, you know, we've really seen the meaning of that. And the fact that, you know, for, for small states, this is not just a, a, a case of, you know, adding a few lines to their speeches, you know, it's there, it's an existential issue for them. Uh, you know, I, th the, I think a couple of, of speeches at the GA session, uh, uh, which maybe were a little bit underreported because so much has been happening, but the uh, German foreign minister who made an appearance in New York, you know, spoke about the fact that every uh, uh, member state in this General Assembly Hall has a bigger neighbor that they might be afraid of. So this, you know, this issue that, that, that Ukraine is dealing with isn't just an issue for, for, for Ukraine, it's also an issue for you. And then the, the Ukrainian ambassador to the UN, who I think has done a very commendable job, you know, given the almost sort of impossible circumstances, you know, he, he talked about the fact that you know, it's really easy to express your commitment to the UN Charter in times of peace. It's a time of times of war that you know it's it's really the responsibility to to recommit to it and reaffirm it. And I think you know that in itself really uh, uh, highlights the, the 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 usefulness of the UN of these norms and the fact that you know it, these norms are under threat now in much more sort of obvious ways, especially by such a powerful member like uh, like Russia. Uh, you know, in in a strange sense, I think you know it speaks to to the, the importance of others that are trying to uphold it and keep the system together, even though it's sort of you know stretching at the seams at the moment. So Anjali, uh, turning back to the research from your book for, for a second, your work talks about the social context of international peacekeeping. Um, can you say a bit about wh what that means? What does it mean to say that peacekeeping is a social endeavor and maybe um, if you have some examples of, of how combatants learn from other contexts from your own research. Absolutely. Um, essentially, saying that peacekeeping is embedded in a social context is basically saying that peacekeeping is a historically um, and socially grounded undertaking. It's one where parties to conflict can look around the world and see what else the UN has done in other places and make their decisions accordingly. So we have this tendency, I think, um, certainly in the scholarly world to sort of treat these cases as closed circuits, to treat them as one-off units and to think about this peacekeeping mission in X place or Y place as being independent from one another. And in the policy realm, we see that given the fact that, you know, the authorization of mandates, for instance, necessarily reflects first the reality of the case at hand and the political contingencies of that situation. But if you are um, a party to a conflict 
in a civil war today. And you want to know what is going to happen to you if you turn to the UN. You could look around the world and look at what the UN was doing in Mali. You could look around the world and look at the world, what the UN was doing in Central African Republic. You could look around the world and see what the U UN is doing in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And that is important context and information um, that is going to be of interest to you. If you want to know whether the UN can provide you with security, whether if you want to know whether the UN can help you uphold your peace agreement, if you want to know what potential other side effects or benefits that might be from UN involvement. And this isn't necessarily just looking around the world um, and seeing what's happening right now. It's also that peacekeeping has a historical record at this point that you may be very familiar with, right? You may have, as many of us do, this sense of the UN's paradigmatic failures in the 1990s as being the dominant mode of UN peacekeeping, um, as being the big lessons from UN peacekeeping. Um, or you may, in fact, and this is something that I found um, in interviewing parties to the Rwandan negotiation process, the historical sense you have of the UN can be from your own lived experience in refugee camps. Right. A lot of the parties to that conflict, their first experience was with the UN as the decolonization authority in 1960. And then their subsequent uh, lives as refugees in UN administered camps. And so their sense of what they could and couldn't get from the UN was grounded in the historical reality of their own lives and of this role that the UN did play in the region. And accordingly, for them, um, even before the Rwandan genocide, even before the demonstrated lack of willingness for um, heavy UN involvement in Rwanda, there was very little uh, faith in the UN's ability to secure a peace. There was very little faith in the UN's ability to provide real lasting security anchored in their own experiences as children in the 1960s and onwards um, with the UN as the decolonization authority. So in that sense, when I talk about UN peacekeeping being a social endeavor, I mean, you know, because we have this uh, apparatus of global conflict management now that's centered at the UN, parties to conflict are not making decisions in a vacuum about what they want from the UN, about what the sort of next steps in their, in their negotiation process is are going to be. They're looking around the world, they're looking at past historical cases, they're looking at their own experiences and grounding their expectations of the UN in that knowledge as well. Um, understandably, the thing before everyone primarily are going to be the realities of their own case at that moment, right? And so that's often the thing we understandably focus on. It is going to be the most important thing. But sort of being aware that these other things are on, in play can tell us something about what you might want from the UN and why you might have very little faith that what the UN is gonna bring you is peace. I just want to remind members of the audience that you can drop us your comments or your questions and, and we'll try to get to as many of them uh, as possible. So think of your questions, let us know. Um, Anjali, Anjali, I'd love to kind of draw out the, the potential policy implications of, of your research a bit more. Um, you've already spoken to this a bit, but what does your work um, for example, tell us about how we might make peace negotiations more successful um, about, about why, why parties engage with the UN. So the sense that I got from my research is that these other potential benefits of negotiation with the international community, these material and tactical and political benefits are possibilities and important draws for combatants, even when they don't think they're going to get peace. And for me, that sort of understanding means that there is a full, as we just talked about and talking about what the UN can still do in Ukraine, right? Um, or what the UN has been able to do even when the P5 were divided on other cases. There is an aid and refugee resettlement and refugee management and political apparatus that the UN has that's really attractive to combatants that doesn't rely on the military power that peacekeeping can bring to a case. It's very rare that what combatants want from the UN is the coercive ability to uphold their agreements. They do not usually seem to want an 
armed intervention that's going to help them uphold the terms of their agreement. Now, a lot of the, the sort of policy and scholarly understanding of this frames this as being sort of um, a set of tools where what the UN is doing is preventing accidents from spiraling out of control and preventing backsliding into war by providing information and sort of um, engaging in diplomatic good offices between warring parties. And at its absolute best, right, in cases like Cyprus, this is what the UN is really doing. It's really serving as a lightly armed buffer between two parties and enabling communication and keeping small accidents from spiraling back into full-scale war. The understandable lesson a lot of people took from the 1990s though, and the understandable lesson that a lot of people take from looking at active crises where people suffer enormously at the hands of armed actors, is that turning towards a model where peacekeepers use more force is a good way to counteract some potential weaknesses um, in this sort of multilateral system. And states, for understandable reasons tend to really like a model of intervention that deals with state stabilization or counterinsurgency or counterterrorism. So in the last couple of years, we've seen the rise of this kind of mission through the, the UN system. It is a very state-centric model of security. It puts UN peacekeepers, um, or not necessarily peacekeepers, UN mandated missions um, into a conflict on the side of the state. And via this sort of understanding of peacekeeping as being a primarily political or aid tool, that's a real challenge. Right? If you are a party to a conflict and what you want is the legitimacy of being seen as an equal political actor and you think sitting down with the UN is gonna get you that, it seems less likely that you would do that if this UN has already demonstrated it's willing to partner with the state to take you on or is willing to um, sign off on the state, viewing you as an illegitimate threat. And in saying this, I don't mean to either like sign on to or affirm any of the goals of people who either take up arms against the state or seek to, seek to squash insurgents, right? It's just to say this is clearly an important function that the UN has served in the world and undermining it may be dangerous in the sense that there aren't that many other organizations that can serve this role in the world. Ashish, I'd love to hear your take on this too when you're reading the book, Incredible Commitments, or you know, hearing, hearing about the findings from Anjali's research. Are there um, ideas that come to mind to you from based on your own experience about um, what kinds of policy implications those insights might have? For sure. Again, you know, quite a, quite a few of them. Uh, you know what Anjali was saying about uh, you know the, the sort of state centric model, for example, and the the UN and the UN missions place in the conflict landscape and how they're viewed within the spectrum of government actors on one side, non governmental you know combatants uh, you know on the other side. You know, I think uh, is is you know one of the sort of classic dilemmas for any. Uh, you know, UN special representative or, or envoy that's that's posted to these these conflict zones, right? Where uh, you know establishing a, a certain level of of trust uh, with ideally with with all parties is what you would want, but naturally because of how you go in and the fact that you, know, you uh, just for the, the the sake of your presence, you, know, you have to have uh, you generally have to have uh, the the, cons the consent of the host government. It usually means that you know, you're uh, going in. Uh, in, in some senses, uh, on the terms of one of the main actors, and potentially one of the main belligerents. And now that doesn't mean that it's carte blanche, right? And one of the things that I was thinking of, and one of the points Anjali was was raising about, you know, about this, you know, reminded me that the UN obviously also has a role in negotiating this. That it knows what, you know, for example, what the, the government might want as a sort of a baseline for its uh, its consent. But then the UN might know where its, you know, its sort of a uh, sweet spot will be in terms of where it wants to end up in terms of its priorities, tasks, and, and focus on the ground. And you know, sort of negotiating that down, finding some, some way that works so it doesn't seem completely on the side of the government and is still relatively impartial. And I think that, that's a challenge, and the UN does it better in some places than than others. Uh, but also, you know, this is uh, something else that that you've written about uh, Anjali in your book is, and I think you flagged at the start as well, is how this can 
uh, you know, for conflict actors uh, also uh, impact their own internal dynamics. Uh, you know, obviously no conflict actors are monolithic, you know, they have their own internal pushing and pulling. And so, you know, we saw this play out quite uh, clearly in the case of Sudan a couple of years ago, when the old UN mission in Darfur, which was sort of the more traditional peacekeeping mission, quite uh, large in, in, in size and scope at one point, was drawing down, uh, just as uh, around the time that the uh, revolution in 2019 happened, uh, Bashir was ousted. And, uh, you know, conversations then turn to how can we support the new civilian led dispensation uh, and how can the, the UN be supportive of uh, Prime, former Prime Minister Hamdok. Um, and you know, the, 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 the focus then became, all right, let's now look at political support, potentially development support, you know, marshalling uh, international uh, support to Sudan in general. And for that, a new uh, uh, you know, UN mission, smaller, uh, more politically oriented, based in Khartoum was the sort of uh, end product. But what, in, the, in the course of this, you know, what we also saw was a fascinating dynamic where you know, the, the conflict uh, uh, situation in Darfur certainly hadn't uh, completely eased up. Uh, the, the, the threats to civilians uh, you know, had been completely uh, uh, you know, put behind uh, the, by the UN mission there. So there was an effort by you know, a couple of council members in New York to see if there's a way to retain some level of of uh, you know, military or police uh, presence, uh, UN uh, presence on the ground to, to address these issues. But what we saw play out in almost real time over uh, maybe I think five or six months in uh, late 2018 and, and 2019 was uh, different parts of the, of the Sudanese establishment uh, uh, relay its views to the, to the UN. So we had uh, not to, uh, this might sound a little bit boring, but there were a couple of letters in specific, one both from the prime minister, but conveying completely different messages. The first one was agreeing to, uh, you know, uh, retaining some level of, of police presence, you know, acknowledging that these risks are still there, uh, you know, in Darfur. And the second letter, and it wasn't too long after, I think it was a month or two afterwards, was a saying that actually we don't want any uh, you know, UN boots on the ground and or a chapter seven mission. And that really reflected, as it was uh, received in New York, reflected the view of the military and what they wanted in the terms that they wanted to set for the UN's presence and, and, and work on the ground. And eventually that was the view that won out. Uh, you know, there was no, um, there was no uh, you know, retained uh, police presence in, in Darfur. And what we uh, pivoted towards was this more smaller, uh, narrower mission, again, with that sort of fascinating mandate of not just serving uh, the good officers role, but also helping marshal international uh, support and helping donors, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, you know, find uh, uh, avenues to which uh, they could send in assistance to Sudan. So uh, maybe unusual in a sense, but really, I think, underscored the fact that, you know, the, the UN and how it sort of fits into conflict dynamics between parties, but also sometimes within parties, uh, you know, uh, is, is, is something that, you know, Anjali is really uh, brought out quite well, and you know we see that sometimes even from our arm, armchairs in New York sort of play out uh, uh, quite you uh, know in a, in, a, in a sort of evident way. So we have we have a few really interesting questions from the audience. Um, I think this one is, is for Anjali, but are there differences between how state and non-state actors um, relate to peacekeeping and its role beyond peace? I think there are, um, and I think particularly non-state actors are anxious for the legitimacy that um, that working with the UN can bring them. And this is something I think that not just my work highlights, but thinking of like Tanisha Fazal's work on international law, um, working with an international organization, proving that you are willing to undertake sort of um, things like political reform or like political dialogue with international representatives um, or the representatives of say the UN, it's a really good way to demonstrate that you are politically serious actors, that you are not uncontrolled, chaotic, um, like warmongers. And that's something that non-state actors can get from the UN in a really critical way that state actors don't really need in the same way, right? State actors have for themselves like the, the totality of legitimacy, right? They, they are clearly in this situation already assumed to be the legitimate actors, regardless of their relationship with the population in many cases. And non-state actors don't have that, uh, don't have that feature 
attached to, to their politics and to their goals. And so for them, turning to the UN, that's an important way to say we have real political projects, we have ideas about governance, we can be good international citizens, we can be committed multilateralists if we need to. And so in that sense, that's a, that's a big distinction I saw between the two sets, broadly speaking, of like state actors, non-state actors. Um, it's that actually sometimes non-state actors can um, prove to be more anxious and more willing to, to be sort of uh, working alongside the UN politically and diplomatically. Just to tie on to Ashish's point a minute ago, um, one of the things we see in the scholarship on, on UN peacekeeping is that peacekeepers are really good at protecting civilians from non-state actors. They are not very good at protecting civilians from the violence of the state. And part of that has to do with the complexity of, of consent, as Ashish just said, you know, to some extent, um, this is about requiring the state's consent to operate, which may curtail where you can go. Um, it may curtail um, what kinds of situations you find yourself involved in. It may simply be a matter of capability, right? You may be outmatched by the state in some cases. But in either way, the relationship between peacekeepers and non-state actors tends to be one in which actually peacekeepers can better curtail the sort of um, potential violence that non-state actors visit on civilians. And the sort of relationship politically between non-state actors and the UN tends to be one in which seeking out the UN's legitimacy is more important to non-state actors than it is to the UN. So uh, looking ahead to where maybe the future of UN peacekeeping is going, um, an audience member asked, do you see the UN peace function evolving over coming years, uh, given heightening UN polarization around China's role. And maybe I'll, I'll tack on my own question, which is you've, you've described this um, uh, transition or kind of pattern where historically we saw maybe peacekeepers as uh, lightly armed diplomats and more often peacekeepers are getting involved kind of directly in, in these conflicts almost as combatants themselves. Um, wondering how that trend will kind of um, shape what you see as, as the future role of UN peacekeeping. I actually think Ashish can speak to some of these complexities better than I can. But, um, you know, when we think about China's relationship with the UN with peacekeeping, it is a complicated one, um, in part because China has been really committed to demonstrating it is um, a serious actor at the UN who takes the UN seriously, um, in part because China is also committed uh, or has historically been committed to trying to curtail the more um, the more interventionist plans or perceived more interventionist plans of the of the P3, the US, the UK, and France, um, and in part because China has also committed to um, exercising influence at the UN by um, increasing the numbers of Chinese staffers, for instance, across different UN bodies and UN agencies. And part and parcel of that movement is this idea of responsible protection that China is sort of planning to try and um, to try and reshape particular doctrines of peacekeeping and intervention into a model that they are more uh, comfortable with. Some of my, my understanding, at least, is that some of what this entails is actually trying to curtail some of the more sort of like human rights dimensions of mandates and to really focus on a more streamlined set of missions in some cases or to emphasize priorities of aid over the priorities of things like um, protection or human rights abuses. And so I want to put that on the table, but say that I think that she's probably better positioned to answer this question about the sort of dynamic future of this as he sees it playing out right now. Yeah, happy to get into that. And I think, uh, again, you know, Anjali, your, your point about, uh, you know, peacekeepers as, as you know, uh, diplomats, uh, you know, I think really, really speaks to, you know, I think where the you know, examples and, and missions in recent years where the UN has been able to play uh, you know, a more constructive and, and helpful role on the political side. And I think, you know, we can acknowledge that you know, most missions, you know, serve, you know, uh, different functions. And I think, you know, uh, have been you know, successful to varying degrees in those functions, but there are 
or some that are, are again not particularly sort of better at the political side you know, using their good offices and you know i think this is especially true in and uh, you know there's a lot of uh, work that's gone into this you know peacekeeping in what we call sort of complex security environments especially uh, asymmetric uh, you know in, in the face of asymmetric threats uh, you know especially in, in the context of uh, where terrorist groups are operating uh, um, and you know whether it's in, in places like mali uh, um, which has, I think, been been in, been in focus, you know, uh, for a number of years for, uh, you know, the the, the very unique uh, set of circumstances that that mission finds itself in, where for sure certain parts of the mission are uh, bunkered down, you know, they're uh, deployed in remote parts of the country in central and northern Mali, uh, you know, where there aren't many international actors, um, you know, so you know, they they obviously also have a target on their back in which limits what they can do. But I think the mission, uh, you know, has done well again to the extent that it can to use almost sort of uh, its 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 presence and, and footprint in these remote areas to have some level of engagement, some level of what you could call sort of bottom up uh, political processes or engagement. Maybe not completely sort of negotiation dialogue, but at least a certain amount of engagement. And you know, especially when you're you're considering the fact that you know these are are uh, environments where again there are a few others that are present there's there's value in you know having certainly the eyes and ears on the ground but to also have that sort of exchange and that and that engagement with with conflict actors and you know certainly i think crisis group has done a, a lot of work in terms of the need to engage with you know even uh, you know some of these actors you know in the in the sahel region in mali and the other uh, countries in the sahel about uh, uh, you know, pursuing dialogue where possible with with some of these groups, and you know, you know it's uh, easier said than done. You know, especially for governmental actors and for the UN, because again, you get into the sort of uh, uh, troubling uh, territory of conferring legitimacy on an otherwise uh, uh, illegitimate actor or a very violent actor. Uh, but you know, I think uh, again, informally behind the scenes, you know, as much engagement as 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 can happen, you know, through the UN through its peacekeepers, you know, I think is its ultimate benefit. And the other part of this is, uh, you know, the, the UN's political function, I'm, I'm curious to see how that evolves. And, uh, you know, I'll use the example of Central African Republic to maybe underscore, I think, one of the, the risks uh, for the UN going forward and the, 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 the risks to UN peacekeeping, uh, because I think it's gone from a country where the, the UN mission and its, uh, its head, the special representative of the UN, it used to almost play a political advisory role to the president. You know, it's a, a political system where I think, you know, especially with the current president, when he first came into office, uh, you know, it was relatively politically green, let's say, and, you know, needed you know, as much handholding as, as possible in those early stages. I think the UN you know, managed that role quite well before the geopolitical uh, scene got much more complicated with Russia entering the entering the fray with its uh, military cooperation agreements with the uh, with the Central African Republic government. But up until that point, I think that the UN served almost in a in a way to guide the the, the presidency to say, look, you know, even on little things like uh, you know making gestures towards the country's Muslim population to say, look, you know, we acknowledge uh, that there uh, some of the conflict dynamics. You know, there was a lot of uh, antagonism towards the Muslim community. But, you know, we're doing uh, our best to include more Muslim members into the cabinet, uh, you know, observe Muslim holidays, you know, little things like that. The UN, I think, played a critical role in making sure that there's at least that level of, of, of uh, thought put into the, the government's uh, 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 actions and, and policies uh, in, in, in the early days. But what we see now is a completely, you know, sort of fast forwarding uh, six, seven years later, a very different environment, especially because of the way in which the UN has had to deal with and has been the subject of mis and disinformation campaigns where it's, it's become the, 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 the subject of uh, uh, um, you know, real life massive street protests to say that the UN is trying to subjugate, neo-colonialize uh, the country and its citizens. It's found it very hard to, to grapple with. You know, that's because of the, in some ways, the infrastructure of the UN, its difficulty in responding to, to these sorts of uh, new dynamics, maybe not conflict dynamics, but certainly sort of uh, challenging dynamics in, in that conflict zone. Um, and I think how and, and whether and, and as much as sort of the situational awareness of the UN can be uh, robust enough to, to account for that going forward and then be able to address uh, and, and let's say nip those situations in the bud will be something to watch because I think that's one of the, the key sort of changes we've seen in recent years. Well, I feel like I have dozens more questions to ask both of you and, and could keep talking for a long time, but 
uh, our time is, is drawing to a close. So maybe this might actually be uh, the last question, but I also wanna look ahead to the future, not, of, not just of peacekeeping, but also of, of the UN Security Council itself, um, especially in, in the context of, of conversations over the past week um, about, you know, kind of the, the role of the P5, uh, the legitimacy of the P5, um, lots of kind of questions coming up about potential options for reform. I know reform of, of the Security Council is a long-standing conversation, but it seems like maybe there's renewed interest in that conversation. Um, I'd love to hear what you both think about the, the possibilities of, of reform and kind of the future of the Security Council. And then, you know, absent reform, do you think, is it possible that we're witnessing or likely even that we're witnessing the decline of the importance of the Security Council um, as kind of a central institution of the post-World War II order, or are we seeing maybe something else? And I think, why don't we start with Ashish and then Anjali can have the final word. Sure, thanks, Alex. Um, that's something that, that we at Crisis Group have been thinking about as well. And I'll make a bit of a shameless plug. My boss, Richard Gowan, will have a piece on basically this question, I think sometime early next week. Uh, you know, so we'll make sure to, to share that. Um, but I think, you know, in, in, the, in the short run, this sort of question of, uh, the, the council, its ability to function, right? Uh, uh, and I think we saw in the immediate aftermath of the invasion and even until today, um, you know, the, the council has been able to, you know, uh, carry out its meetings and functions, you know, renew mandates of, of missions and renew sanctions regimes, et cetera, relatively business as usual fashion. Uh, but I, I am worried about the fact that, you know, as the potential level of brutality on the ground in, in Ukraine uh, increases and is much more visible, um, but also if Russia tries to take this approach they've taken over the last couple of years at the council, which is to bring its own narratives to the UN, uh, which they've done bringing in pro-Russian um, uh, stakeholders from Crimea and, and Donbass to uh, you know, brief the council to say that, look, actually, you know, Ukraine is the, the, the bad actor in this. You know, if, if that sort of the dual dynamic of more brutality on the ground and more, let's say, provocative diplomacy on the council increases, I think that could really make uh, a compromise between the again the P3, uh, you know, US, uh, France, and UK, and Russia really less appetizing for for Washington, for Moscow, for Paris, and because at one point it might start to become toxic to uh, you know have a, a you know a, a sort of good faith give and take you know, even on issues where they they do have common ground. So I'm worried about that. I'm, I, you know, we certainly hope that there will be a level of compartmentalization. You know, we talked about the Syrian humanitarian track. That was one of the, I think, most notable areas of convergence between Russia and the U.S. last year. Um, and one of the few positive uh, notes for the council, uh, you know, again in the last year, whether that'll fall uh, uh, victim to the, the obviously this new, you know, reality that we're in. Uh, you know, we'll find out in the summer. Uh, so, you know, all, all of that means that you know, I think the the sort of uh, short term uh, uh, sort of challenges and questions about the council legitimacy, we might just be sort of starting to to uh, uh, you know, hear those. And I, and I think uh, the final word I'll say on this is again, I think it'll increase the, the importance of the, the 10 elected members you know, who rotate and you know, certainly don't have the, the advantage of continuity on the council, et cetera, uh, but they are able to you know, drive certain things. So whether it's bringing their own initiatives to the table at the council or uh, you know, basically sort of nudging behind closed doors, the permanent members to define areas of common ground or to propose things on the table that tries to bridge the gap between uh, the P3 on one side and Russia and China on the other. I think that gives me a little bit of hope that you know, with proactive members of the council, there can be certainly at least a minimum level of cooperation. But again, I think a lot of this will depend on how, how bad things get uh, you know, on the ground in Ukraine. So we'll, we'll have to see. Go ahead, Anjali. Just following from what she said, you know, I agree with everything he said. A lot will depend on the next couple of months and the dynamic that emerges at the Security Council. But when we weigh the sort of... Um, when we weigh the sort of two competing strands against each other, what we have is, um, oh, sorry, let me try that again. Um, we have to weigh two competing impulses, I think, on the part of the P5 against one another. One is that actually they need this chamber in many ways um, in order to keep exercising this outsized influence on international peace and security in a comparatively costless way. Um, and that is true for all permanent five members. 
the, the council has legitimacy because they invest it with legitimacy, because they take problems that they want to solve multilaterally to the council and try and resolve them there. It is much more challenging, it is much more difficult to try and resolve these problems outside the forum of the Security Council. And here I'm talking about problems that are not of primary national interest to them, right? Um, I'm thinking of questions like what to do with um, an outbreak of civil wars that are distant from their primary national interests. And in that sense, working through the Security Council, just being entirely cynical here, right? Uh, working through the Security Council is a good way to manage that problem in a way that still leaves you with the final sort of set of voices on what the nature of war and peace looks like in the world. But we have to balance that against the fact that when you have primary interests, you may be willing to, to use the council in ways that actually torpedo its legitimacy in a larger sense. You may, as a result, find that other actors are willing to act outside the council to secure their particular ideas of what peace and war look like in the world, and in doing so, strip the legitimacy of the council um, for the other members. And, and I think, you know, when we talk about UN Security Council reform, we hit up against the problem we always hit up against when we talk about reforming powerful institutions. The actors that benefit from them are not invested in reforming the institution, right? Um, if you are a P5 member, what incentive do you have to give up your veto? What incentive do you have to expand the Security Council? Every once in a while, like the US will toss out the idea of, of adding um, another permanent member to make it more representative, but we know that's not a serious proposition because almost always what they raise is a, is a state that will immediately be objected to by another permanent member. Um, and they know that. So it's a sort of like a easy political way to score some points on a problem you never are really intending on solving, I think. Um, and there are not, I know this has come up a number of times recently, um, there are, there's no internal process of reform here. And I know it's understandable that people are turning to this and it's understandable that it's entering the sort of mainstream political discourse as a possibility. But by the terms of the charter, there's really no way to reform the UN Security Council without the consent of the UN Security Council. Um, and there's really no way to remove one of the veto wielding permanent members from the UN. Beyond that, we probably wouldn't want to, right? Because we need a world in which these permanent members believe they are bound by this body of law, even when they act otherwise. And we sort of see that they accord this institution legitimacy because they feel the need to do things like bring in actors to spread disinformation, as opposed to just saying, we did it, deal with it, right? And so in that sense, there is this sort of competing set of interests to balance. And I don't know which one will emerge, but I do think we're at a very dangerous spot. Um, in the same way, you know, we were in the early 2000s as well, following the US invasion of Iraq. This is another sort of turning point where we try and see what emerges and hope that it turns out to be something that you know, furthers the interest of people who live in fear of violence and and fear of death. Well, thank you so much uh, to you two for these incredible insights. Um, thanks to our fabulous events team at New America who, who makes everything happen. Um, thank you to our friends at Bridging the Gap, Jim and everyone else. Uh, we're really thrilled about this, this new partnership and we'll have a series of upcoming events featuring new and, and kind of exciting uh, research that to share with policymakers. So keep an eye out uh, for that. Um, and, and thanks so much Anjali for sharing your research with us and, and everyone should check out her book, Incredible Commitments. So thanks everyone, bye.